Hello and welcome back to another edition of Press Pass on GNAT TV. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director at GNAT TV's News Project. It's a pleasure to have you with us today on Wednesday, September 28th. It's also a great pleasure today to be joined in our virtual studio by two distinguished journalists. Uh, really appreciate them uh, both making their time on, uh, on a busy news week. We're really pleased to have with us today Howard Weiss Tisman, who is the Southern Vermont reporter for Vermont Public. And Steve Pappas is the editor of the Barry Montpelier Times Argus. Gentlemen, thanks again for uh, stopping by and making the time for this. Happy to be here. Yeah, happy to be here. Well, um, we have lots to cover, lots to talk about. Um, and I guess I thought we could start with uh, the general state of the elections as, as you both see them. Uh, Howard, let me start with you. Uh, what's your takeaway on, on the races? I think it's really interesting looking at this whole race, what's happening. There are so many kind of side stories going on that you have these uh, constitutional amendments we're talking about a little bit um, with slavery and reproductive rights. Um, you have really the historic election that there's a possibility that Vermont could elect a woman to Congress for the first time. You know, so there's, there, there's also the first time um, that they're mailing out ballots to everybody. We did that during the pandemic, but this is the first time following the state law that passed. You know, so there are all these kind of side stories going on. It'll be so interesting to see how many people turn out. Um, the Reproductive Freedom Amendment has a lot of strong opinions on both sides that could bring people out from, you know, both ends of the aisle, so to speak. Um, so it's a little bit harder to call. I think that that um, Lieutenant Governor's race is going to be a little closer than people think. I think a lot of people know um, Senator Benning, and he's got a lot of name recognition. So um, a lot of it is playing out as we thought as far as the front runners, but I would not be surprised by some surprises that might pop up with everything else going on. And Steve, what's, what's your take on it so far? Yeah, I would agree with all of that and just add that I think we can expect a pretty strong turnout come November. Um, I, I think that Howard's right. I think that the, especially Article 22 is generating a lot of buzz, not necessarily within the actual races themselves, but in the fact that it's going to bring a lot of people out. Um, Lieutenant Governor's race, to me, actually is the most interesting race. I, I, I think that um, two candidates, including a, you know, a former Lieutenant Governor and David Zuckerman, who, who has already named some name recognition and a, and a base, um, he's not, you know, he's not across the board well liked among um, all, all of the Democrats and the Progs, but he certainly um, has a toehold. Um, but Joe Benning is, as Howard said, he's, he's well known, he's well respected, um, he's tight with the governor, um, and you know, the, the certainly that if if the the Republicans turn out in in force, which I think it certainly this race is suggesting, um, or this election cycle is suggesting they may, um, I think that race is going to be very close, and um, I think that. Uh, I don't, I can't say as much about the gubernatorial race. I think that, um, you know, I, once again, we're seeing Phil Scott's non-campaign campaign taking hold. Um, and uh, it's, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few weeks. This is a lot different than the primary though. I mean, the primary was really interesting to me and, uh, and to, I think all of us who were watching it because um, there were a lot of, a lot of races that, people were really unsure about and excited about. And once the primary happened, it kind of set the stage for, um, I wouldn't say it's a lukewarm um, race on the ballot for governor, lieutenant governor and the down ticket races, but it's not, it certainly isn't as exciting as it felt like it was going to be in the primary. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you on the lieutenant governor race. Uh, that would, that's certainly one I've been kind of intrigued with because uh, if you think that perhaps this might be Phil Scott's last term, if he's successful in November, uh, that would be a fourth term. That seems to be the rough time when a lot of governors, at least recently, have chosen to move on uh, if the voters haven't already given them the, uh, the heave-ho. Um, that would put whoever's lieutenant governor uh, in a very good spot to run for 
the top job if that's what they were inclined to do. And I, and I agree with you about uh, Senator Benning. Uh, we had the pleasure of having both uh, uh, David Zuckerman and Joe Benning down in our studio a couple of weeks ago for a, a head-to-head conversation. And uh, he definitely comes across as sort of a, I'm trying to think of the right word here, moderate, normal Republican. Uh, he's certainly uh, you know, a very reasonable kind of guy. And, uh, you know, I, I could easily see him capturing a certain amount of uh, independent votes and crossover votes and, and that sort of thing. So, Yeah, it's so interesting to watch because both Governor Scott and um, Joe Benning are both in favor of the reproductive rights. So um, just so interesting. That's so Vermont. You know, it's not really as cut and dry as, as you would think in a lot of states. And uh, concurrently, you know, the voters that come out, I mean, it's an imperfect science, but looking at how this all sugars off um, after the votes are counted in November with who goes for the constitutional amendments, who ends up swinging over maybe some moderates towards the Republicans. So I think it's, it's going to be interesting when it, when it all comes out. Well, well let's talk about Proposition 22 for a second, because um, uh, I've, I've been kind of intrigued about that. It clearly is generating a lot of... Uh, discussion, shall we say, at least in terms of uh, lawn signs and uh, and letters I'm getting in my mailbox uh, from various uh, folks. Uh, Brian Doobie, a former lieutenant governor, sent me a, a letter you know, last week saying I should vote no on Article 22. Uh, I, guess, I guess the argument there is that would allow for late-term abortions uh, in the final trimester and that seems to be the, the focus point of a lot of the uh, folks who are uh, not feeling positive about Proposition 22. But if you look at the numbers, there are very, very few late-term abortions performed anyway. At least that's my understanding. Yeah, I, that, that seems to be the case. And that certainly there's been a fair number of commentaries that have come out in the last few well, within the last week from folks in the medical profession, including George Till, uh, Harry Chen, uh, basically trying to clarify what they see as um, concerns over the language that's being used um, and, and, and mischaracterized in this debate. Um, to be clear, this is Article 22, formerly known as Proposition 5, and we, we just want to make sure that yeah. um, calling it the right thing. Um, the, we also are being inundated with letters and, 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 and actually calls and comments and concerns about this race from both sides, feeling that um, it is not a slam dunk. Um, they, it's not, I mean, I don't know if what you're seeing is a sign that folks are, are very concerned about, more concerned about this than they otherwise would have been, but, um, you know, we're, it is certainly something that has dominated uh, our editorial page up until a few weeks ago, where we actually told folks, if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to sound off on one, and propose, essentially get behind one of these sides or the other, uh, you're going to buy a political ad now because it, it's come down to um, very little about the issue. It's, it's very, you know, the, the issue itself is, seems like it's a straight up yes or no, but the nuance of it is, is definitely playing politics hard. And I think um, what we will see, again, um, it depends on who comes out, but um, I think the independent voters are the ones who are really going to decide that issue again. And, uh, you know, that, I mean, that's, it's a difficult one. It's, you know, abortion is always, the or reproductive rights are always kind of the third rail issue and proving to be again in this election cycle. But the one guarantee that's going to come from this is it's going to drive people to the polls. Yeah, I think it's an important to acknowledge we haven't mentioned the outside money that's coming in because of this race. And I think a lot of those mailers you're seeing, um, Andrew, I wouldn't be surprised if, if the money that supporting those mailings are coming from out of state on both sides of this issue. This is not just the folks who are opposed to this amendment getting money from out of state, obviously Planned Parenthood, both uh, in Northeast and the National is putting a lot of money to this. There's a lot of national attention on this race in Vermont. Um, there's a couple of states that have it on the ballot and Vermont is one. So a lot of people are watching this. Um, there's a lot of outside money coming in and, uh, you know, we're going to have to see how Vermonters 
react to it. I, I, I think it's going to be pretty overwhelming. I could be wrong. It sounds like both you guys, um, you're in a little more conservative pockets of the state than I am maybe. So maybe you have year to the, year to the ground. Um, I, I'd be surprised if this didn't pass by two to one. I could be wrong, but I think there's a lot of support, especially with what's going on nationally and what happened in the Supreme Court. It's in the news. Um, I, I, I don't think it's one of those things where someone's going to pick up the ballot and be surprised to see it. I think a lot of people are aware it's out there and um, I think it's going to pass pretty strongly, but we'll see. I, uh, I, I was a little surprised that um, the diocese has, has kind of taken a, I mean, they've taken a position on it, but it's not a strong position. And, um, and there, I'm not seeing a lot of, of, pushback from the diocese per se. I'm seeing, we're getting pushback in both the Rutland and in the Barry Montpelier markets from um, the Catholic members of the Catholic church, including deacons and former deacons and, 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 and that, that kind of uh, a pairing, but we're not seeing, um, you know, this is one of those issues where you, you kind of are expecting there to be a big push from the Roman Catholic Church, and uh, we haven't really we haven't seen that. There is a statement on the diocese website, and um, and but even the folks who are who are, are reaching out to us, um, the real Bible thumping folks who are quoting chapter and verse in their letters to the editor are not talking about and and my church my church in Vermont believes this, which has been interesting. And there's been a little bit of pushback, at least in the Barry Montpelier market about, well, where is the church? You know, what's going on there? Well, uh, let's pivot over to another, uh, another story that's uh, well, already been much written about and discussed, uh, but is going to be hitting some sort of landmark moment uh, let's see, later this week. Uh, on October 1st, uh, legal cannabis will be uh, on sale or available in those retailers who have obtained permits to uh, to open shop. Uh, I guess I'm just curious. What are what are both of you hearing or about or sensing about that issue? Uh, it's it's been under discussion for so long now. It almost seems anti anticlimactic that oh, finally, we're here. Um, well, I think anticlimactic. I think one reason why the um, it might be expectations are tapped down a little bit is that this is going to be a very very soft rollout. Um, it is going to open October 1st. I think there are a handful of shops that are gonna open, but not all of them that have applied will have their license in time. There's really not gonna be enough product around. Um, I'm not sure what that's gonna look like after a week, after a month. Um, I'm working on a story talking to some of the outdoor growers who are getting on board with this. That's one thing the state was really surprised about is the number of people who applied for outdoor permits, it's about two to one to indoor. And that surprised a lot of people. Um, obviously, cannabis has been legal in Massachusetts for a long time now. Um, it's working its way in New York and Maine. And that's a, another reason why it's anticlimactic is that, you know, Vermont is not ahead of this one. We're used to Vermont being ahead of things and we're really, you know, riding on fumes here. Um, so the state is trying to put a lot of focus on this craft cannabis idea that the, the cannabis that's grown in Vermont is going to be better, more natural, outdoor grown. Um, I don't think we're going to see a lot of that right away. So it's interesting in a lot of states, Massachusetts, the rollout was, was, um, was delayed over time. So Vermont did hit its October 1st deadline, but it's not going to be the way it looks this uh, weekend is not going to be the way it looks in a year or two. So I think it's going to be a soft rollout, um, but but the state did get it together. So it is opening October 1st. We're definitely seeing communities around the state that are still struggling with, um, you know, do we want to have cannabis sold uh, in our, you know, within our town limits and, you know what we're what we're seeing both in the Rutland market and in the Barry Montpelier market is this uh, this um, kind of hand wringing over um, well what what happens if somebody comes to us and they want to start an outdoor growing facility or they want to start a, uh, a, a dispensary and 
Um, Barrytown, for example, uh, has not voted on whether or not they want to uh, allow uh, dispensary, but they're already putting the mechanism in place to kind of uh, create a vetting system um, for such a time when everyone decides that maybe Barrytown does want it. And that vetting system is lots of steps. And so it's going to be one of those things where people in a uh, more conservative community like Barrytown um, might find themselves throwing up their hands and saying, I'm going somewhere else. And so the, the, the part of the pause we're seeing right now, which I think is, I actually think it's, it's good that we're not, we're not seeing a massive number of folks who are, who are just trying to open the, open their doors for dispensaries and that it's, it's kind of measured. Um, but I think we are seeing um, various communities positioning themselves to be more in a uh, taking on more of a regulatory role uh, in what the rollout looks like. And I, I feel like in the long term, that actually could hurt the, the, the industry. But, you know, it's hard to tell because I, again, I don't think any of us know exactly what the response is going to be. Um, I have family over in Maine where they do have lots of dispensaries and it is, you know, it is, it, it, it's a different, it really is a very different dynamic in the states that have, have allowed it. And, um, and I think there's also plenty of discussion that's going to be coming up about how are we going to tax this? You know, what are, you know, what are the long, -term, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to kind of um, monetize this to benefit the state? And I don't think we have all those answers yet. You're both involved in media shifts of one sort or another. Howard, uh, I know you wanted to talk about the uh, merger uh, of Vermont Public, uh, Vermont Radio and uh, on TV. And, and, and Steve, I wanted to ask you about the Water, Waterbury Reader, the paper that you were working with. Um, so Howard, let me just start with you. Uh, tell us about this merger. Uh, no, it's, it's fully completed. Our boards have merged. Um, all of the, the finances have gotten together, development, et cetera. Um, a lot of folks in the organization are still feeling their way around, but um, for the most part, the merger is complete. And um, what we're doing in the content department is where we're moving kind of slowly. So there's no like big grand plans um, to shift things. The legacy public radio people are, are getting to know the legacy um, PBS people. Um, you know, there are some ideas being sketched out now. Um, can't talk about yet, but um, but it feels good. It was it was um, smoother than I thought. You know, I mean, a lot of people worked very hard on it, and I know for a lot of people, um, it was a lot of work. But from our perspective, you know, the way the news is, you, you can't really stop it. So we were doing our thing and uh, reporting daily, and um, that's continued. And uh, most people are excited about it. Um, you know, there's real interesting, we could do a whole show about this, but there's some really, really interesting stuff going on in public radio right now. And a lot of people are kind of equating it to like where newspapers were 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting discussion, you know, for a very long time, VPR and public radio, what we had were towers on mountains. And that's how we brought you Click and Clack. And that's how we brought you Prairie Home Companion. And all those shows, for us old timers, the only way you could listen to Prairie Home Companion was to tune in Saturday afternoon. And now, of course, everything's moving online. Um, everything is on demand. And so for years, what public radio um, provided the people of Vermont, it's really shifting. And you don't have to tune in to listen to Terry Gross three o'clock on a weekday. You can listen to her any, any hour of the day and listen to a whole program. So there's some really, really interesting dynamics going on between Vermont Public and every public radio station in the country and national public radio. Who needs each other more? You know, we give them a lot of money to get all things considered a morning edition. They want that money. But if people are just going right to the NPR website and not listening to BPR, you know, where, where is all that shifting happening? So it's really interesting conversations. Um, 
we feel well positioned. We feel like the merger was a really good move. So, you know, here in Vermont, we feel like the infrastructure is in place, what the future looks like, um, demographics, trying to get younger folks on board, a lot of, lot of conversation, a lot of change in the next five years. All right. Well, we'll certainly be following that as we go along. Uh, and Steve, I wanted to ask you about uh, the, um, the partnership you had with the Waterbury Reader, which started off as an online publication, I believe, uh, about two and a half or so years ago, uh, and then evolved into a print publication. Um, and the Barry Times Argus was helping helping them along, but uh, I guess that partnership is coming to an end. Is that is that the right way to put it? Yeah. So um, first, I've got to say, Howard, that uh, I hope that that BPR and V, the Vermont public is not going the way of newspapers because that is a that is a it is a real struggle and I'll be talking about that in a minute. I will say though that we appreciate the letters to the editor from the folks who really wish you would change the name back to Vermont Public Radio and we're getting <laughs> inundated with those. So, um, so after the pandemic started, the Waterbury Reader, which uh, the Waterbury Record, which was owned by a group um, out of uh, out of Stowe, um, stopped publication of that of uh, uh, that weekly. And that created a news desert in central Vermont and a group of, of journalists and uh, students formed an organization, an online nonprofit called Vermont Roundabout. And the Vermont Roundabout um, started basically filling in where uh, the Waterbury record had um, kind of fallen off. And they were they began covering the meetings, the major things. Um, they didn't have a big staff. There was not a lot of money behind it, um, but they were putting their content up online and we were seeing it and decided that we would approach um, Lisa Scalotti, who was the, the founder and editor of the Waterbury Roundabout about the possibility of using one of our um, weeklies free weeklies that goes into every home in various zip codes. Um, and that, so the penetration would be 90% of the people in, in a community, in that community um, that, rep, that are represented by two zip codes in Waterbury. And that we, because we already had it, that we would use their content and we would print it, we would publish it, or we would uh, produce it, we would print it and we would distribute it. And that, um, the advertising and the inserts that went into those uh, publications every week would cover the cost, except that the inserts um, and the advertising never really manifested over the course of the two years that we had the partnership. Cost about $2,000 a week for us to do everything I just described. And we were losing about, on average, about $900 a week um, from the beginning. So over the course of two years, that's $100,000 loss on a project that, should have been a home run and it failed for a handful of reasons that are basically newspaper related they're print related they were not um on the at, at kind of on the backs of the the nonprofit model of that online publication lisa's publication is strong um serves its purpose but people wanted the print publication they wanted it to just show up in the mail on a friday afternoon and have something that they could look at um, the problem is that there wasn't the financial backing there for it from the, the business community. Part of that was our fault because we weren't raising the flag there frequently enough. And part of that was that um, the struggle of, an, of the newspaper industry is a real one. And it is, you know, it is, it, people don't, people assume the information as a, is a free service and they don't necessarily want to have to pay for a subscription or pay for advertising when there are so many online um, portals for them to get news out or get their message out about marketing. So uh, we, it went for a loss for a long time and we gave the folks in Waterbury a warning, you know, 90 days out or so and said, hey, if, if this doesn't turn around and folks don't start advertising, or there's some kind of influx of, of revenue, I'm pulling the plug. And it was, it was totally on the Times Argus's. Um, it was totally on my, it was my decision. And, uh, and you know, again, kept giving the warnings and it, it didn't turn. And then when we shut it down, all of a sudden the business community said, wait, we wanted a, a print publication. We love print. 
you know, what can we do? And at that point I had, you know, I was like, well, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens. Lisa's getting a nice influx. She's riding a nice wave of support right now um, in the community. And the, the business community is really rallying around the work that, that they're doing. Um, but it's just not something that we, we thought the model was great because it allowed us to put our product, um, you know, basically an ability to put our inserts into homes with some news, with a, with a wrapper that, that had some hyper local value. And it was, it was such a great model. We were looking at other demographics and other markets where we could do the same thing. And uh, we had identified four other locations where we were going to do the same, same kind of model and not doing that now you know, definitely rethinking it. But we still have three other readers. Um, we have one in Middlebury, one in Rutland, and one that serves greater central Vermont. So we still have the others, and those are making money, but just the Waterbury one um, did not. So and it, was a, it was a sad day to shut it down, but I'm really glad that the community, community there is rallying around the online model. I find it interesting, though. I, I was at a conference over in uh, Keene, New Hampshire, a week ago where... There was a panel about uh, community journalism, and, and one of the things I kept on pointing out was that uh, local community uh, journalism is much more trusted than sort of the national mainstream, quote unquote, media. It's just interesting how uh, if you got that sort of uh, sense of the need for local coverage of, you know, local select board meetings and whatnot, uh, that's more trusted and, and believed in than and uh, if you know somebody from out of state writes about it or something, well, they wouldn't cover it in the first place anyway. But it's just interesting to see where that's all going. It's some real challenges, especially again looking at the demographics. So you know you have these younger folks who are who are used to getting their stuff for free, and they're the ones who are coming up. That's the market we're trying to reach. That's the market that's our future, and they grew up getting everything for free. So um, I think it's only going to get more challenging, unfortunately. In the 30 seconds or so we got left, uh, are there any local stories you guys want, just wanted to mention real quick uh, to bring well, us? Well, we were talking here? about the election a little bit. We've got a pretty hot race uh, for Wyndham Senate. Um, again, it's a pretty historic race. Um, Jeanette White and Becca Balland are both move, moving on. So we have two Senate seat open. We have a full... Um, Six people, two Democrats, two Republicans, two independents running. So that's a pretty hot race down here. That's gonna be something we're looking at. And also very quickly, um, the hospital budgets were approved recently. I know that Steve, that's a big issue in Rutland. I think that's gonna be a big issue when lawmakers get back. Um, they've been bleeding money for a long time. They kind of were kept afloat with a lot of COVID money. That money is coming to an end. And some really tough decisions have to be made about our hospital system. Some people think we're overbuilt. We have more beds, more buildings than we need. Um, some people don't think that. Um, so it's going to be, that's going to be a hot topic, I think, um, next year. And Steve, anything up in your neighborhood there that's uh, on the front Well, I think, I think statewide, we are continuing to look at the, the rental assistance money and what what's going to happen, happen over the next few months as that money continues to be phased out. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a safety net created there um, with some found money, um, but, you know, we're going to have a pretty vulnerable population of uh, Vermonters out on the street in pretty short order. Um, conveniently, it was extended, the, de the deadlines all seem to be, have been extended past the election cycle. Um, boy, isn't that convenient. Um, yeah, but it's going to be cold after the election cycle is over. And uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to see lawmakers and, and leaders, uh, social service organizations, community action councils, all those folks are going to be on the hot seat to try and figure out um, what the next steps there are going to be. And I would just say that um, one thing that we are seeing as a result of the pandemic is more use of obviously virtual um, platforms at community levels. And we are now seeing high levels of abuse of that, of uh, folks illegally using executive sessions and not using, not being as transparent as they should. And we're in the process now of calling out about a dozen communities 
um, in both the Barry Montpelier and Rutland markets for uh, misuse of uh, their their interpretation of the open meeting law and uh, and how they've been using the virtual um, system to kind of get information out. So. And that includes Rutland, the, the city of Rutland and the city of Barrie and a few others. So it's going to be, I think we're going to see some interesting coverage coming out of communities about kind of holding them accountable for the decisions they're making. Yeah, very quickly, the rental assistant reminded me, it kind of goes to the hospital money. It also goes to the legislature. I think there's kind of a, going to be a COVID hangover where everyone's been so used to these hundreds of millions of dollars um, that's all drying up. That support a lot of program, rent relief, housing, hospitals. The schools got a bunch of money. Um, as that money, you know, winds down, all the challenges are going to be back. And so it's going to be interesting to see how law lawmakers, you know, balance that. Um, a lot of expectations. So you have all these people getting housing assistance. There's no more money for that. And uh, how do we move on? Mm. Well, all right. We'll have to leave it there for today, gentlemen. But uh, once again, thank you both very much for making the time for this conversation. Really, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, always good to hear different viewpoints and perspectives from around other parts of the state. Uh, really uh, grateful to have had with us today Howard Weiss Tisman, the uh, Southern Vermont reporter for Vermont Public, and Steve Pappas, the editor of the Barry Montpelier Times Argus. Uh, and thanks to all of you as well for being with us. Hope you found our program interesting and well, we'll see you again the next time. Mm -hmm.